Today, we will examine the question, why green manufacturing? What are the compelling business motivations for retooling the way products are made? What fundamental changes are occurring? And how does this transformation compare to previous paradigm shifts in manufacturing? We are privileged today to have Dr. David Dornfeld as our speaker. David runs the Laboratory for Manufacturing and Sustainability and is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. He's going to provide a context for where the state of manufacturing is, where it's going, and why. He will also offer perspective on how business leaders can take advantage of this sea change. David has a PhD, an MS, and a BS degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin. He's also author of the blog, Green Manufacturing. Moderating the question and answer today is also Corinne Reichweiser, the Director of Climate Services at Climate Earth. And now I'm pleased to introduce David Dornfeld. Thank you very much. We are trying here to increase the awareness of the context in which the changes in manufacturing are occurring and opportunities that will be provided by uh, green manufacturing and moving towards sustainable manufacturing. So I think if at the end of the seminar you have a better understanding about where things are, where things are going, and how you might be able to uh, take advantage of that and fit into it, that will be, will be very useful. Let me start with a very small story that I tell my students on how to phrase where you fit in, in, the, in the world of information. There's a, uh, a ribs place in uh, Berkeley on the corner of University Avenue and San Pablo Avenue called Everett and Jones. It's a great kind of family-run operation. And fantastic ribs. The place is plastered with, um, with uh, signs on the wall and bumper stickers. And one that's particularly interesting is it says there are three kinds of people in the world. Those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that say, what happened? And I tell my <laughs> students, uh, at least please try to be one of the first two. Do not be one of the third type. And I think this is an example where we really want to be uh, a make things happen crowd. So if we go on to uh, the topics, uh, you see three basic sections of the presentation today. We're going to talk first in some detail about manufacturing, it's important to understand how manufacturing has evolved over the last couple of hundred years and what were the important lessons we learned from those and, of course, how we can then present those relative to the um, changes envisioned by green manufacturing. And uh, that's going to be uh, discussed later on in the presentation. So I've characterized these shifts uh, as this kind of a timeline uh, going from craft production on the left all the way through other changes to what we hope in the future to be uh, sustainable manufacturing, sustainable production. Uh, we're now kind of at the interface between small lot production and sustainable production. We incorporate everything we've learned in the previous years and the previous changes. But the next big jump is going to be very interesting, and that's kind of the context in which our presentation is taking place. So what I'd like to do now is step through this in a little bit more detail uh, so we understand what were the changes that took place, what were the motivations, what we can learn from that, and how we can apply those to the next big jump, which is this transition to sustainable production. If we look first at craft production, which basically goes back to zero, right? I mean, this is uh, people in very early times BC that were doing handwork and creating small pieces. It was essentially uh, driven by people who had a uh, tremendous capability to do a large variety of things. That is, there was not any particular specialization. I mean, you had people who did mechanical work and people who did uh, artistic or, or fabric work or carpentry work, but it wasn't uh, a person who just drilled holes or just uh, hammered nails. Uh, the individuals involved in craft production essentially were their own bosses. They did all the planning. They did all the organizing. They accumulated all the resources. They determined how they were going to spend their time. They determined how the process was going to evolve. And they worked at their own pace. So you'd get tremendous products from these skilled craftspeople. But if you tried to, for example, compare the product from one craftsperson with that from the other, it was likely to be quite substantially different. So don't try building a system where pieces fit together, because it would be very difficult to do it. So processes varied and the product varied tremendously. But at the time, the delivery method was very successful, and the quality was extremely good. But, but varied. What happened then 
is people began looking at this so sort of late 1800s, early 1900s, and began to be bothered by the fact that all of the things I just mentioned that were characteristics of the craft production were, in fact, uh, issues that made it difficult to really scale up the process. And there was a gentleman by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor, uh, and also uh, him along with folks like the Gilbreth, Frank, and Lillian, who were industrial engineers, uh, organizers, began looking at this uh, rather erratic uh, helter-skelter manufacturing process and trying to extract some principles and some organization. So without commenting you know, on the quality of life for the individual craft laborer, who often you know, worked in guilds and had uh, uh, communities of people that shared the same expertise, um, Taylor, uh, and with the assistance of Gilbreth and others, introduced a couple of basic concepts. First of all, tasks that were considered to be relatively complex were broken up into discrete elements. So if you were a machinist or a carpenter, rather than you building the entire cabinet or you making the entire um, tool or, or gun if you were uh, working on uh, weaponry, you would essentially make parts of it. So that allowed a delineation of authority and responsibility for each section of the task. It made it possible then for whoever was managing the organization to separate these individual tasks and organize them in what they thought might be the most effective way to do it. And it allowed them to essentially optimize or at least to extract some efficiencies from the, from the process. So the specialized task became a, a particular event. So think of a concept of a butcher who in the old days might have uh, done the entire um, disassembly, if you will, of, uh, of an animal as part of their preparation of uh, food for sale is now working on an assembly line uh, and essentially just uh, making certain cuts or, or taking certain actions relative to something that was moving down the line. And since I mentioned assembly line, Henry Ford was one of the first people that really kind of, of um, figured out how to do this in the sense that uh, to be able to provide a product that was both standardized with interchangeable parts produced in high volume with reasonable cost in a timely and a, and a predictable fashion, you needed to have this kind of framework that Taylor put together. So we call that mass production. So you lost some of the specialization, but you gained a tremendous amount of efficiency and control, which was one of the things that was used. You also had to introduce something called buffers or inventory. So there were steps between the process where you needed to either because of legs or leads of the previous process or the, or the following process, you had to be able to accommodate variations in the flow rate of materials, so you had to accumulate stock or you had to disperse stock into the system where you had to have inventory to pick up when something wasn't there at the right time or something broke and had to be replaced. So that was an, a, a characteristic of mass production that didn't really show up earlier, but it also uh, allowed you to separate out these, uh, these uh, lack of control and make some pretty good optimization to make the process much more efficient. 